What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Big Blue in the Bronx podcast. Be sure to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when the live stream pops up your jobs. Appreciate y'all coming back. Uh, I apologize for the low voice. There are people sleeping around me. And uh, for the lighting, I didn't bring a light down uh, when I was packing. And, uh, well, I have no light now other than this. So, unfortunately, it's going to have to do. But, of course, if you're listening on podcast platforms you won't have to deal with it but you can uh listen on spotify podbean apple Podcasts. let's get those ratings up and all that good stuff appreciate you guys coming back also share this out as well um but uh the giants play the eagles this weekend it's going to be an interesting game you know obviously it always is whether it's a blowout whether it's a two-score game whether it's a close game or one by a field goal which it's you know happened like that before for the giants um and this is a game where the Giants are most likely resting their starters. So, I mean, I'll try to get through as quick as possible, but I don't want to make this a shorter podcast episode because, I mean, 15 minutes before the interview, I mean, that just looks like you're just doing some fast food content. Like, that's not what I want to put out for you guys. But we do have a guest interview with uh, Jeffrey Knox of Inside Eagles, who is... Uh, which is the uh, fan side for the Philadelphia Eagles. So, you know, there's some stuff there. And he, he provided some great, uh, some great, I would say, I wouldn't say advice, but information. Inf- great information regarding the Eagles and some of the things coming up. But uh, we had a good discussion. So looking forward to that in the second half of the episode. Uh, but let's go to the injury report. John Feliciano is uh, questionable with a back injury. Dexter Lawrence will play. Aziz Ojolari will not play. He is out with an ankle injury. And Len Williams is out with a neck injury. Adoree Jackson is doubtful with the knee injury. And Xavier McKinney is expected to play. Um, obviously, they may or may not rest, guys. Uh, we don't know who they're going to rest. We can predict. But uh, that's going to be a discussion probably in the latter half of this portion of the show before the interview. But the Eagles are going all in. They want to play their guys. Um... And this is a game where they got to get the number one seed. And they could fall to as low as five, I think, if they lose this game. And I don't know if they could possibly fall to three. But it's going to be interesting if they do lose this game, especially against Giants backups. But uh, a lot of the veterans for the Philadelphia Eagles actually got a lot of rest this week. So they probably are best prepared uh, for this game. But they do have some injuries. Lane Johnson is out with a groin injury. Vontae Maddox out with a toe injury. Um, Josh Sweat, he's out with a neck injury. So that's obviously going to hamper them in terms of pass rushing. Uh, Sean Bradley, the linebacker, he's out with a wrist injury. Jalen Hurts is questionable with a right shoulder injury. Um, I think he's going to play. I think it's going to hamper his ability to run and be a mobile quarterback, which, you know, if Don Martindale is going to put – a winning game plan out there, and he will, whether it's backups, whether it's starters, or, you know, we could even play the game of, okay, maybe try to knock him down a few times and get him hurt, not intentionally, but just, like, sack him a few times so, you know, he looks a little less comfortable in the pocket each time. Um, so, overall, he won't have much mobility, at least in my opinion. He may, he may not, he may be 100%, he may not be 100%. But he's questionable with shoulder injury. He's probably going to play. And then Janarius Robinson, he's out with an ankle injury. And uh, the rest is literally rested, guys. So let's go into the uh, 2022 stats and analytics. Giants are 17th in total yards per game on offense, 26th in pass offense, 4th in rushing offense, 15th in points per game. Defensively, 24th in total yards per game, 15th in passing yards per game. 29th against the run in 16th in points per game. Analytically, they are 28th in pass percentage, 5th in run percentage, 29th in pass percentage on first down, and 4th in run percentage on first down. They are 1st in blitz percentage, 5th in pressure percentage, and 15th in sacks. So, no surprises there. Obviously, they're working their way up. Only got two sacks last week, but there was a decent amount of pressure obviously in my opinion like last week's game is not a game you go off stats other than points uh daniel jones had four touchdowns but only had like 250 to 270 total yards um 
the defense, I mean, yeah, they got a pick and two sacks and four quarterback hits, but for shutting down the Colts' offense to 10 points, you know, it doesn't add up. So you actually have to watch the game. But Eagles offense-wise, second in total yards per game, eighth in passing offense, fifth in rushing offense, third in points per game, which it will hurt this game. Uh, that Adoree Jackson is not in the game, most likely. Uh, it looks like they're going to rest him towards the playoffs, um, which is a good idea, but also you want to knock the rust off him, and I guess they're going to say, hey, listen, we'll do that practice, right? So uh, defensively, they're first in the categories of total yards per game and against the pass, 18th in rushing, uh, allowing big running plays and all that sort of stuff, and uh, they're eighth in points per game. 27th in pass percentage, 6th in run percentage, 27th in pass percentage on first down, 5th in run percentage on first down, 18th in bliss percentage, 2nd in pressure percentage, and 1st in sacks. So them and the Cowboys have been really fighting these last few weeks for like 1st in defense, 1st in sacks, 1st in passing defense. So it's, it's interesting. It's good to know that the NFC East is at least back up there. Um, in terms of being a relevant division, you know, having these different groups fighting for top defense in the league, uh, also offense as well. So three things that I'm really looking for in this game or watching out for is, number one, the Giants resting a ton of starters. If you're injured, you're probably not playing. Giants, you know, already declared Aziz and Leo out, neck injury and... Um, I think they said ankle with disease. Let me check real quick. Disease has, yeah, ankle injury. So they don't want to push them to play in a quote-unquote meaningless game. Uh, Dory's already doubtful. Um, maybe some other guys will get some extra playing time, extra rest. Uh, Daniel Jones, I don't see him playing for maybe more than a drive, if that at all, uh, because you know Philadelphia will try to knock him down as many times and probably, you know, not necessarily injure them, meaning the Giants starters being Barkley and Jones, but, like, to try to push them into the playoffs without their starting quarterback. Not in terms of hurting, but, you know, it's more of, hey, let's knock off somebody so that they have a disadvantage in the playoffs and they're eliminated easier because, you know, they're our rivals, we hate them. But I see Saquon resting... Um, I don't see any of the weapons resting. They might play Galladay a little bit more. Uh, this Giants wide receiver room, and I'm going to jinx it here, unfortunately, because you know, stuff like call into existence. But it's been pretty healthy for the talent. You know, it has. Richie James has been healthy. Jerry Slade has been healthy. David Sills has been healthy. Kenny Galladay has been healthy. Uh, Isaiah Hodgins has been healthy. So I don't see any of those guys resting. Andrew Thomas, I think, will rest. Uh, I don't see, really see a reason as to why he should play. Evan Neal might, but he's a rookie, so he's not established yet. He really, you know, other than the injury, uh, which he might still be hampering, you may not want to play him. You may want to play him. Who knows? Uh, the interior, I mean, we really haven't been too unhealthy there other than left guard. But I would play the interior. I would. I'd play the interior. Um, in terms of the defensive side of the ball, you're going to be playing uh, Fabian Moreau. He's going to be playing either way. Same thing can be said for Nick McLeod and Cordell Flott and some of the other corners that we have, not named Darius Williams. Uh, I think McKinney will get some burn, and then he'll rest for Pinnock. And then same thing can be said maybe for Julian Love, because Julian Love has been smart, tough, dependable, which is the Giants – I would say uh, slogan for the Dable era, smart, tough, dependable. And, you know, I think a lot of Giant fans personally overrate him. Uh, I don't think he's a Pro Bowl caliber player, but I think he's had the best year of his career by far. So, um, you know, I think he could rest. I think he could rest as well. A lot of different guys we're looking for in this game, it's evaluating, but we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, in terms of the evaluation standpoint. Eagles r running the ball a ton. Obviously, you know, there are times where you want to throw the ball a lot, why, you know, why you want to do it, 
what if we can assume we're on attack, you know, all these different things. Um, and obviously the Eagles aren't a very, I would say, uh, frequent passing offense analytically. But when they do it, they're pretty freaking good. You know, A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, all these different guys. But the reason I say running a ball a ton is they could easily gash this run defense. That's A. B, I mean, you're probably not going to have too many on the defensive line playing. Maybe Dexter Lawrence gets a few reps, but I wouldn't, you know, put him in there at all, to be completely honest. I wouldn't put him in there too much. And the linebackers, man, they're pretty shit. I'm going to be honest with you. Michael McFadden's a rookie, so you're not going to expect too much there. And even then, I don't think he's a good run defender. I don't think he's going to be that in the NFL. Uh, Jalen Smith isn't very good. Um, let's see other linebackers we have. Landon Collins, I mean, he's been very exceptional, which is a good thing. Tony Jefferson as well, but they have limited roles. Uh, Gerard Davis, we'll talk about evaluating because he's now a New York Giant. So, um, And even just to like take off the pressure in terms of Jalen Hurts, right? You don't want him throwing the ball a bunch of times before you know anything happens before he gets pulled whatever which kind of leads into number three is eagles pulling stars once they get a sizable lead um, obviously they will pull the starters if they have enough in terms of a point differential but at the same time they are probably keeping in mind hey listen we have a lead and you know we need to get some guys reps because if they get the lead um I'm pretty sure they go and get the number one seed. Now, I'm forgetting, I'm being, I'm being a little, uh, I'm just, my mind's all over the place, but I'm pretty sure Dallas could still end up taking the division if Philly wins. Um, but Philly might have more wins at the end of the, you know, uh, at the end of the season, at the end of the game or whatever. So, I mean, we'll see, but if it's a scenario where even if Dallas wins and, you know, let's just say Philly wins and, you know, in that situation, Philly gets number one seed, then they'll rest the starters, but they'll still evaluate some guys for the playoffs because you don't want to totally rest your guys and, you know, lose the number one seed or, or you don't really want to, um, you know, just leave guys rusty. You don't want to do that. Um, we usually go over players to watch, but I'm going to go over the last game and point out some uh, very good contributors. Jalen Hurts, 21-31, 217 yards, two touchdowns, four sacks, 85.6 QBR, and 109.2 passer rating. Uh, Miles Sanders went off. He's dealing with an injury right now. Uh, they're not listening to him on the injury report, but he is dealing with something. 17 carries, 144 yards, two touchdowns, 8.5 yards per carry. Jalen Hurts. Seven carries, 77 yards and a touchdown. And Boston Scott, six carries, 33 yards and a touchdown. He probably will have a touchdown this game because uh, the last few games against the Giants, you know, he just does that. He just puts it in the end zone. In terms of receiving, A.J. Brown, four receptions, 70 yards and a touchdown. Devonta Smith, five receptions, 64 yards and a touchdown. Um, Jack Stoll and Grant Calcaterra each had two receptions. Quez Watkins had four. Um, I do expect Dallas Goddard to be a part of this game. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if McKinney is in coverage, if Pinnock is in coverage, if Julian Love is in coverage. I think it's going to be Julian Love. Um, but see who's in coverage on Dallas Goddard. I mean, the Giants have defended tight ends pretty okay. Uh, you know, no one's really erupted on them. But Dallas Goddard could have a pretty big game before the bye week and then before whoever they play in the playoffs. So just a player to look for there. Um, also, as we mentioned, uh, Lane Johnson, he's out with an injury. So Jack Driscoll, who gave up three sacks to Cam Jordan, he's going to be playing that right side again. So Kayvon or O'Shane or Taman Fox or Jihad Ward, take advantage. Take advantage. And Quincy Roche, if they call you up, take advantage. Um, in terms of top defensive players, Javon Hargrave had a quarterback hit. Josh Sweat had quarterback hit a tackle for a loss actually two quarterback hits and a sack uh, he's not going to be playing this game he's got the injury from the Saints game because you're waited a quarterback hit Hassan Reddick had a tackle for a loss a sack and a quarterback hit Milton Williams also had two quarterback hits uh, two tackles for a loss and sack Fletcher Cox had two quarterback hits a tackle for a loss and a sack 
Brandon Graham was pretty eruptive against Evan Neal. Three sacks, three tackles for loss, and three quarterback hits. And then uh, Marcus Epps and TJ Edwards also had a tackle for a loss each. And uh, Epps and Maddox were the top tacklers, but Epps uh, is not injured, unlike Avante Maddox. And CJ Gardner-Johnson is actually expected to return this game where he did not play against the Giants. Uh, they may stick Gardner-Johnson in the slot uh, before they end up putting Josiah Scott there, but we'll see what happens. I'm going to pull up CJ Gardner-Johnson's stats on the fly. Um, in coverage, he's given up a 72% completion percentage, six interceptions on the year, three touchdowns, 79.2 passer rating, uh, three pressures, and a sack this season. So he's played really well. This is one of the best seasons of his career. Um, definitely, if he was healthy, Pro Bowl nomination, if he hasn't been nominated already. But, uh, you know, with that being said, in terms of C.J. Gardner-Johnson, uh, he's going to be a factor this game. He's going to be a factor, and he's definitely going to be getting reps. Because they don't want him rusty two weeks in a row. You know, it's nice to get him reps. Uh, TJ Edwards also, as I mentioned, probably will be a factor as well. So there is that. Questions to answer, then we'll go to keys to win in a score prediction. Uh, question to answer, which starters play on offense? I think, once again, the, the targets will play, the wide receivers, the tight ends, uh, the right tack, probably left guard to right tackle plays. I don't see Thomas playing. I don't see Jones playing. I don't see Barkley playing. I really don't see those guys playing um, because, you know, those are high injury risk type of guys. You know, all those guys in their career have suffered at least one injury or two. That's caused them to be out several weeks. So um, in terms of that, you don't want them getting hurt. Don't play them. Who gets the bulk of the carries, Brightwell, Brito, or maybe even Deshaun Corbin? Um, I don't think they'll call up Corbin. They might if they just decide, listen, Barkley's not even going to play anything. He'll be inactive. Um, so I think it's going to be Breida that gets the most carries. The Giants did a lot of good things last week in garbage time with Gates and Neal and all these different guys pulling. So, you know, maybe expect the same thing. They may expect some different things in the running game this week uh, for the Giants, but they did have some success with the pulling of the offensive linemen last week and then um, you know basically Matt Breed again outside the tackles who starts the five spots on the old line uh, I think personally me it's going to be Matt Pear, uh Ben Bredesen Nick Gates Tyree Phillips and then Evan Neal now obviously you can mix that up Jack Anderson might play a little bit um, they may call somebody up from the practice squad something like a Solomon Kinley also I have to you know mention why Davis is now a giant, and they want to see what they have in him. He was on the practice squad before. Now he's on the active roster. So expect him to get some reps this week. Maybe they you know, put somebody inactive like a Feliciano and say, okay, listen, why Davis is now active. So um, I think he played mostly right guard in college. Uh, wasn't a very successful pick for the Vikings, and that's why he's been you know, basically moving all over the place. I think he was in Arizona or New Orleans for a little bit, but regardless which starters play on defense, I don't think anyone other than Dexter Lawrence plays on the D-line. Linebackers, you'll see the same. Um, secondary, you'll see probably more Pinnock, less McKinney, unless they decide, hey, listen, you know, you got to play more reps. We haven't seen you in weeks. Julian Love, I could see sitting, uh, but the corners are going to play. I don't see Radarius Williams playing because I feel like this coaching staff is going to stick to their message to him saying you outed us on social media and you know that's just not a good thing that's just not a good thing whatever the case may be you don't do that so um, I think they're going to stick to benching him I, I don't like it but listen it is what it is at this point I don't control any of that stuff um, let's go to keys to win number one stop the run I agree with that now obviously I'm a guy that's like stop the pass I'm more of an analytical thinker if you guys haven't noticed um, but with that being said I think it's going to be a lot of run this game they in my opinion once they get a sizable lead they will pull their starters and then just run the football you don't want Gardner Minshew passing and then he makes a mistake throws a pick and all of a sudden shit the Giants are back in the game and it's backups against backups so 
Um, they may have better backups than us. You know, we'll see what happens. But they want to put themselves in terms of, you know, the game. They want to put themselves in front by a sizable lead. So the running game, in my opinion, is going to be very crucial for them. And I think it's going to really be the front of this Eagles offense. And it's going to gash the Giants' defense. Uh, I'm just sticking to how I feel. It's real. Miles Sanders is dealing with an injury, though. A lot of people don't trust Kenny Gainwell. So who knows? Might be Boston Scott again. Uh, number two, stop the pass. Or at least limit the pass. I mean, you're going to be playing the corners you did a few weeks ago against the Eagles. You know, uh, Fabian Moreau, Nick McLeod. Darnay Holmes, they're going to get toasted, but you got to stop the pass, limit the pass. And number three, win the, time, win the time of possession. Win the time of possession, in my opinion. Um, because that, I mean, obviously that goes to the running game. Stopping the pass, I mean, it factors less in time of possession uh, unless they're doing dink and dunk passes, which basically was the first few drives in that Eagles game. So win time of possession is basically number three. If you can run the football... Uh, Tyrod Taylor, if he can at least be a game manager, hey, listen, you know, that's uh, that would be a good thing for us Giant fans. I'm going to do a prediction, a little bit of a talk, and then we'll go to the interview. So I think it's going to be 30 to 13 Eagles. I think they'll run the score up at the end just to get up a sizable lead. Um, you know, I would not be surprised if we get it closer or if it's more of a blowout, but this game doesn't mean too much to me. But I'm going to stretch that into another conversation for two minutes and talk about evaluation. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a ton of depth guys that may be free agents that are trying out for another team next year that are trying out for this team right now. Wyatt Davis, Gerard Davis, um, you know, let's see who else. Tyree Phillips, right? Some of these guys aren't starters. They're not going to be playing. Some of these guys are starters, and they're free agents. Jalen Smith may not be back next year, and this could be a game where he goes, okay, you know, I haven't played well all season, but this is where I need to step up rather than, okay, you know, in the playoffs, just show it against a good running team. Not that the Vikings, the Niners won't be good against the run, but try to create momentum for yourself going into the playoffs. That's what starters should do. Um, and even the same thing with the backups, because if Gerard Davis does well, maybe he finds himself in a good role in the playoffs against the Vikings or the Niners or some of these other teams that are battling for the third seed. Um, but evaluation is important because I know, obviously, we are thinking playoffs. We are thinking, you know, maybe we can make some sort of a run. But Joe Shane is thinking future, compete for today, build for tomorrow. If Gerard Davis could be a part of this football team as a solid run stopper, they may value that as him as a depth piece with Darian Beavers next year, Micah McFadden, then bringing maybe somebody over from Buffalo like a Tremaine Edmonds or a TJ Edwards or some of these linebackers, or getting somebody in the draft. Depth is key. Giants don't really have depth in a lot of positions. If they do play Rodarius Williams, can he be forgiven by the coaching staff and bounce back and get an interception or two? Because he played really well in that Dallas game. I was surprised, once again, he didn't play in that game against Washington. You know, they put Zion Gilbert in, which they may do again, um, like they did against the Colts and the Commanders. But, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, Ryder Anderson, Henry Mondo, make a name for yourself. Uh, let's see who else. Obviously, it's a dead duck with Kenny Galladay. Um, if Deshaun Corbin somehow makes it on the roster for this game, make a name for yourself, right? Um, just make the most of your opportunity and make it a good thing, um, leave a good name for yourself on your evaluation sheet for Joe Shane, Wyatt Davis, Gerard Davis, uh, Jason Pinnock. If they elevate Terrell Burgess, he could be playing, you know, a decent amount of snaps. So we'll see what happens. Giants, uh, I think they're going to lose this game 30-13 as mentioned. Let's go to the interview with Jeffrey Knox of Inside Eagles, which is the fan side covering the Philadelphia Eagles. All right, so now I am with Jeffrey Knox of Inside Eagles uh, for the Eagles covering for uh, Fan Sided. Jeffrey, obviously a lot of implications, more for the 
Uh, Philadelphia Eagles side in terms of the one seed coming into this game more than the Giants who've already clinched the sixth seed. What are your thoughts and feelings coming into this game and riding off of a loss to the New Orleans Saints? Pretty confident. Um, not the most ideal situation. We walked into the last three weeks of the season. Oh, we needed to win one game and we lost two straight, which was apparently, from what I understand, what Gardner Minshew was supposed to prevent from happening. <laughs> Didn't work out that way. Um, this most recent game uh, versus the Saints lost out on three opportunities there. We were able to, we were unable to clinch the division, which was goal number one. Goal number two then being with the one game at a time approach that we were supposed to lock up that top seed, as you mentioned, and get that first round by, which is all important with the injuries we have. Goal number three with the, with us being in ownership of the Saints first pick in the coming draft, it would have been nice to have knocked them down a little bit and give them another loss, but things didn't go that way. From a confidence perspective, I think everything will be all right. Um, as Eagles fans, we're used to these unexplainable losses at least once during the season. Miami a couple of years ago um, wasn't necessarily lost, but the 2017 campaign, which actually resulted in our first Lombardi, we had an ugly night against the uh, Raiders on Christmas. Christmas, actually, I was going to say Christmas Eve, but actually Christmas Day. But um, there tends to be a success pattern we have again versus the Giants and everything. So I walk into this one pretty confident and um, from what I understand as you stated with the guys resting uh, possibly resting your starters there um, that means that our first string is probably looking at backup so doesn't give us much of room to brag in the case of victory but should help us accomplish the goal we're looking for yeah definitely uh, going into that quarterback position uh, before we get to Gardner mentioning all these different things uh, let's start with Jalen Hurts uh, who's currently injured what steps has Hurts taken to becoming a better quarterback this year alongside the weaponry the organization has upgraded this year? I was one of those people I never really doubted Hurts. There was one moment. Um, we, we saw some mechanical issues um, during those first four starts towards the end of his rookie season. Um, there were some things that just looked um, a little, for lack of a better term, not up to par. But um, he worked with a throwing coach during the offseason and everything. I've never questioned Jalen from the neck up. Um, we had some questions about whether or not he can complete certain types of passes or make all the throws. Um, I went back and looked at some college film, not being an Alabama or an Oklahoma fan. <laughs> that took a little while. But the only concern I think I had about Jalen coming into the season was whether or not the most impressive we've seen him look as a passer in Oklahoma came as a result of him just lining up and playing against Big 12 defenses, which we know tend to be non-existent. Um, but I trust quarterbacks who, not to throw anybody under the bus, but aren't playing Call of Duty on the iPad and <laughs> aren't necessarily getting themselves in trouble off the field and things of that nature. What you show me as a mature individual off the field typically translates to what we see on the field. Um, never question Jalen's work ethic. Uh, worked with a throwing coach in the offseason. Um, make sure he spent some time with the guys who are already here to build some chemistry and some camaraderie with them. And then um, the, as you mentioned, the uh, acquisition of um, a new teammate, AJ Brown was going to help that anyway. Um, sometimes they say phrases like system quarterbacks. I never prescribe to that. I think everybody's a system quarterback. Joe Montana was a system quarterback for goodness sake. <laughs> it was a great system. He was a great quarterback, but who isn't a system quarterback? Um, when you surround these guys with great talent, great individuals, and guys who believe in them, typically that ends to six, that ends the only end game there is success. And um, I'm, I'm I'm starting to see what I always believed that he was capable of doing from day one. Next question is obviously you talked a little bit about uh, Gardner Minshew, and obviously these last two games were tough losses. Knowing that, well, you only have to win one to clinch and all, do all these different things in terms of playoff implications. Uh, how has he played, obviously? Um, you mentioned that, you know, it's not really been up to par and that Eagles fans and maybe people outside the organization are like, yeah, you know, Gardner Minshew, there's not going to be much of a difference. But it sounds like in terms of your tone, there has been a crucial difference between the two. When you said Gardner Minshew, the first thing I was doing here, uh, it wasn't trying to not give the eye contact as appropriate, but looked up some of his statistics here. Uh, seven and thirteen with the Jacksonville Jaguars, which is impressive with the Jacksonville Jaguar team too. Was on uh, one and three with the Philadelphia Eagles and things of that nature. But um, he came in with the mindset of winner. 
by definition, that isn't exactly what that is. But I I still have confidence in Gardner, to be honest with you. I think he had a bad game. I don't think um, this this team as a whole put him in the best position to be successful. Um, we kind of just rolled out with the game plan of we're just going to throw Gardner in there and just ask him to do everything we asked Jalen to do, which um, was probably – not gonna say probably, which was probably the worst, the uh the worst game plan we could have rolled out of bed and walked into the field with. But um Gardner has tools, Gardner has some ability, uh, which is why he stuck around the NFL this long. I think some of the strength of Gardner is in knowing that Gardner will pop up from a game or two from time to time. Uh Gardner meant you as a 18 week, 17 game starter. I don't know if we believe in that, but um if you haven't prepared for Gardner, if your main focus has been Jalen Hurts all year and Gardner has to be, come in and be asked to win a game, we were under the impression that uh, that should have been what he was able to do. But um, there was just some – I don't know if there was some confidence issues. I don't know if there were some things that he was just incapable of doing that we just probably believed it a little too much, but um, some, high, some high throws, um, some of that settled down as he started to calm down a little bit. Um, Perhaps if we'd have gotten the same guy that showed up and played against the Dallas Cowboys, we probably would have came out with a victory. But the drop off from week 16 to week 17 was tremendous. No explanation for it other than the fact that we just probably rolled out with the wrong game plan and just tried to ask him to do things he's just not capable of doing. Yeah, and then obviously moving back to Hurts a little bit. Uh, Hurts was limited today with the shoulder injury. Do you think he plays on Sunday and um, I'm probably going to garner. Now, I'm obviously, I'm an outsider, and I'm asking the Eagle fans' opinion. Maybe I'm just guessing on this. I presume in terms of your thoughts of what you would want to do is you would want to play him because if you do get this win over the Giants, which, uh, to be honest, I'm going to predict, you guys have that one seed. You have the buy to rest him. That way you don't have to worry about resting. But do you think he'll play this Sunday, and would you play him? My... I never disagree with the plan that the Eagles walked in with. I would have done exactly what they have done. Um, I probably would have sat him against Dallas. The theory was, and the conversation was, that if Jalen absolutely had to play a football game, he would have been ready to do so, and he would have been capable of doing so. Now, the question is, is he able to do that at 100%? And if he's not able to do that, do you risk injury? Worst case scenario, do you want to run the risk of going into Arlington, Texas on Christmas Eve injuring Jalen Hurts further, and now you don't have him past Christmas Eve. So I agreed with the theory in the beginning. Um, I also thought that this team was should have been good enough and capable of beating New Orleans without him. So I was fine with sitting him last week. Um, confidence, I'm not going to lie to you. Confidence is a little shaken. Um, I still believe this is one of the best teams in the NFL. Um, they didn't play like it last week. That happens in the NFL. Um, regardless of what the other team's record is, any given Sunday, and those guys on the other side of the uh, sideline, they actually have NFL players too. But I would I would play Jalen Hurts based on the fact that after two weeks of rest, he should be as close to 100% as possible. And there's also the scenario of Russ. Um, having him sit out for the final three games of the season and then have a bye week means he's had a month off and everything. You have to factor that in because now you're going into the postseason. He hasn't played in a while and you're playing better teams. So – I agree with it in theory. I agree with what the coaches did and what the decisions were. I would not have played him against Dallas. Um, hearing again that he wasn't for a different reason. That was um, hearing for a different reason. I wouldn't have played him against New Orleans, believing that regardless of what happened in Dallas, um, he, this team should have been, again, capable of securing a win over New Orleans without him. But now with the situation at the end, needing to win, in, needing to win, having to get a win, unable to secure that final win in those final three games, and now you only got one shot. You always, as they say in the old days, you got to give yourself the best opportunity to win, and this team's best opportunity to win comes with Jalen Hurts. Absolutely. Still staying with the offense and uh, shifting past the weapons towards the offensive line. Lane Johnson looks like he won't be back until the playoffs with the injury. Uh, who has played in his place and how has the O-line done since his injury? I saw the stat sheet uh, briefly before we got on here, and I think Minshew took something like six sacks, a lot coming from Cam Jordan. Uh, does that have to do with Lane Johnson's replacement? Talk about it just a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, in place of Lane Johnson, I mean, teams have a depth chart for a reason. 
Jack, Jack Driscoll is the next man up on the right side of the line. I like Jack Driscoll. Um, same conversation to some extent that we were having regarding mentioned. There's a lot of belief in Jack Driscoll. Jack Driscoll showed a lot of promise. Jack Driscoll's problem was his first two seasons in the NFL, he couldn't stay healthy. Um, now, I'm not sure of the fact that he's staying healthy now is the fact that, you know, he's the next man up and he's in the second on, on the second string. But placing him on the right side of the line did cause some issues historically, regardless of what people want to say about Lane Johnson, some decision making in the past and things of the nature. The guy's a baller. Um, any conversations about some missteps and some ideas, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about and things of that nature. Um, those probably just enhance some ability he had. He's fine without he's fine without performance enhancers and things of that nature. Lane Johnson is probably one of the best right tackles we've seen coming the game in a long time. I personally believe he's a Hall of Famer. That's my guess. Um, some people can disagree with that. I think he's probably do maybe like a couple of Pro Bowls that he didn't earn without him. Team looks a lot different. Team looks totally different um, from a schematic standpoint. Instead of allowing Lane Johnson to sit on the right side of the line and just go one on one with whoever, now you have to slide protection. Maybe you take Dallas Goddard out of a, a pass route and you're using him to chip guys, you're using Miles Sanders to chip guys and everything. The entire protection shifts right. But Jack Driscoll almost put Cam Jordan in the Hall of Fame by himself. Six of those of the six sacks that you mentioned, three of those came off of the right side off of Jack Driscoll <laughs> as a result of Cam Jordan's efforts. So personally, and, you know, obviously I'm not a coach and my opinions don't count and they're not going to listen to what I have to say on things of that nature. We've seen success with a former first rounder, Andre Dillard, who hasn't been able to get on the field because he was beaten out by a former rugby guy from Australia. But this is probably our last ride with um, Andre Dillard. Doesn't look like he's going to be back last year. This is the final year of um, his deal after they actually gave him his, um, they honored that fifth year option on his rookie contract. So he's probably out of here. I say get as much out of him as you possibly can. We've seen some ability on the left side of the line. He can play a little guard, but not great. Um, can't play right tackle, but is a decent left tackle. And we've seen, again, schematically some situations where um, in the absence of Lane, we'll slide Andre onto the left tackle position and then um, slide Jordan Melata, our starting left tackle, over to the right side. That's paid dividends. I'm not exactly sure why they didn't want to do that again on Sunday, but if push comes to shove, maybe that's an option. But um, Jack Driscoll, um, again, may have contributed to some of the issues that Gardner Minshew was having as well. Yeah, definitely. And moving to the defensive side of the ball a little bit, still speaking on the injury aspect, uh, many have had several different opinions when after the Washington game, you guys signed Dominic and Sue and Linval Joseph to add depth to the defensive line uh, once again due to injuries. How do you think they have performed thus far? I'm satisfied with Linval and uh, in Dominic. Um, Linval is kind of taking a step past some people that we already had here. He was actually starting against in uh, New Orleans in that game. Um, possibly at this stage of his career, maybe in terms of both of them, better run defenders at this point of their career than pass rushers. Um, Linval Joseph has never really been known as an exceptional pass rusher, but did have some ability. Um, and Dominican Sue, you know, that's really where he made his main name from. And some people have made Hall of Fame mentions about him, but they've slid in, they've been, they've done it really well, which is pretty much why you saw them so early, um, stepped right in in the Indianapolis Colts game. Um, gave some quality snaps and things of that nature, but they solidified, which is probably the uh, strength of our entire defense and our you know team in general, the interior of the defensive line. So you got um, Fletch, who is aging, but um, I think a lot of the benefit to what Linval and Dominic have brought is they've been able to spell guys, and because they've done so, they've actually allowed other guys to play better because they don't have to play as much. So we're looking at Fletcher Cox, who um, – a uh, future Hall of Famer, but probably hasn't had the greatest of run in the last couple of years. Um, he's actually had his best season from a statistical standpoint since 2018 when he had his last Pro Bowl. So seven sacks there. Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, somewhere between like 43 and 45 tackles and things of that nature. So their presence has actually upgraded his game. And we're seeing like um, last year's third round draft choice, Milton Williams, he's playing well. Um, and he's pretty much come on as of late. Um, they're trying to figure out where to put him in the formation. He's gotten a lot of looks with Jordan Davis um, being unable to stay healthy, who I'm also excited about. 
but um, Milton Williams, um, four sacks for the season, things of that nature. Um, can't argue with 60 plus sacks from a team and a franchise record and possibility of breaking the 84 Bears record. So, um, yeah, and a lot of that is attributable to the um, the presence and the success that we've seen with Linval and Dominican. Right, and then shifting over to a more interior defensive lineman, how has Jordan Davis played since returning from injury? Well, Jordan Davis is out again. Um, he had a concussion issue. So he had the high ankle sprain and things of that nature. Um, to answer your question, I like what I see from him. Um, a lot of his job in the Jonathan DeGannon scheme isn't necessarily stacking numbers and you know being impressive statistically himself. Um, a lot of what he did is what he was asked to do at Georgia, um, eat up space, create opportunities for some guys around him. He did that well. Um, still waiting on that first career sack. Um, you look at the statistics, it probably wouldn't be dim, um, demonstrations of what it is that I'm saying, but Jordan has some ability and has done what they've asked him to do at this point in his career. Obviously, with us having so many of our guys, uh, I think we have like 21 free agents, including Fletcher Cox, including Javon Hargrave and things of that nature. So you're going to see a lot more of him in year two. Um, and we kind of expected that, especially with the amount of money that they had extended to some of the guys who were there. And his absence from the high ankle sprain actually led to the um, inclusion of Linval and also in Dominican. So um, Jordan Davis, I'm ha happy with for what they've asked him to do. Um, I'm unhappy in the fact that we thought we'd see him a little more. Um, you can't have a top 15 draft choice playing 25 snaps a game or <laughs> somewhere around 15% of the snaps for a game. But based on what they've asked him to do, he's been fine. And then he came back from the high ankle sprain and then actually unfortunately suffered a concussion and things of that nature. But um, looks like they're going to look to work him back in. And the hope here is we just opened a 21 day practice window for Chauncey Gardner Johnson, 21 day practice window for Robert Quinn, who was kind of like, um, a gamble and you're kind of pushing all the chips in and try to just make a run for it and go for it. Haven't gotten much from him, but if you can get anything from him in the postseason, that's a bonus. And, um, it's probably a position where he kind of has to perform now because with Josh Sweat being out of the lineup with injury towards the end of the game last week, and we're not sure what his, um, his physical state is for the postseason run. Um, probably going to need Robert Quinn to step up a little bit. And I think he can do it. Um, kind of the like same thing as Flesh with so many bodies and so many guys that can rotate on that side of the ball. Um, hopefully keeping him fresh and hopefully the rest and the recovery time he's had since he's been out will allow him to um, at least put maybe three good games together for us. We'll see. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned Josh Sweat, who is many of the pass rushers you guys have off the edge. Um, you mentioned there's some uncertainty about how much of a role he will have in the playoffs due to the injury. How do you think the edge will do in terms of uh, trying to replicate the production that he had and the whole D-line had with him? How do you think they'll do in his absence? Uh, maybe, well, most particularly pertaining to this week, because obviously our O-line has done well the last three weeks, but obviously an Eagles edge can very easily change that. We've seen them experiment with some things. Um, mentioned some of the guys on the interior, Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave. Uh, those guys can actually play a little edge if necessary. Probably not. They don't look like traditional edge rushers, and rightfully so, because they're playing out of position. I mean, um, a lot of people take for granted that they just think you just slide a guy a couple of feet to the left, and all of a sudden he should be able to do the same things he's doing in the middle of the line, which is not the case at all. Different, um, different formation, different mindset, different everything. But um, I think they're good enough. Are they as good as what we've had for the majority of the season? Probably not. Uh, I worry about Robert Quinn. He's starting to look like Ryan Kerrigan 2.0 to me. But, again, limited role, rotationally, three games. Maybe he can put something together for a three-game stretch. That's if we lock up the um, uh, home field throughout the postseason, obviously. But um, – and then the Milton Williams, who I mentioned earlier, I'm told that Milton Williams can play on the edge. I've actually never seen him do it, but we'll see again there. But um, with the bodies they have, you have a, whole, uh, a healthy Jordan Davis somewhere around the 350 range. You have an aggressive Indomitian Sue, Linval Joseph, be it Javon Hargrave if you leave him there. You got Brandon Graham on the other side. 
may not matter who you put on the left side and in the rush. Like they'll be given opportunities just based on the fact that everybody has to spend so much attention being worried about everybody else. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned uh, CJ Gardner Johnson before, but also uh, to dip into the cornerback room a little bit after returning from my R uh, Vontae Maddox is once again hurt uh, this time with a toe injury. Uh, we mentioned how CJ is nearing return, but how did Maddox play when he was healthy and will there be anything missing in terms of on the field if he continues to be sidelined? That's a drop off from Avante to Josiah Scott. Um, with the CJ Gardner Johnson situation, he actually is a slot corner that we actually transition to safety. So worst case, uh, worst case scenario, maybe you can slide him down and let him play a little slot corner, something of that nature. Um, satisfied with what we've seen from undrafted rookie Reed Blankenship. Kayvon Wallace, for some reason, it looks like the light switch, the light bulb is finally going off and things are starting to make sense to him. Um, Marcus Epps and who is our other safety and uh, Avante Maris are kind of the same guy. They're really talented. They're very physical. The matchup I was most interested in seeing in the Cowboys Eagles game was Avante Maddox versus CeeDee Lamb. Um, the injury took care of that, but I'm Epps has all the heart in the world. He'll bang with anybody. He'll stack the box. He'll 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 run down. He'll he'll run into somebody as hard as he can. He's just he's just small. Same thing with Avante Maddox. Avante Maddox has all the heart in the world, but the style of football that he plays. I doubt if he'll ever be able to hold up for a full 17 game schedule, but worst case scenario, hopefully he's back. If we're able to make a strong run, win two games, get in the Super Bowl, maybe he'll be back in the Super Bowl. That's not a guarantee either, but the hope here is typically with the exception of about maybe one or two instances, we've seen guys activated to the active roster. Once we've seen them have their 21 day practice window open. So Hopefully we get CJ back this week. If it's um, not the situation, I believe that we can win without him and he should be good to go for the uh, division around. But um, he's he's versatile and I'm very satisfied with CJ Gardner Johnson. I mentioned all the guys that we have to worry about looking at extensions for at the end of the season. He's actually one of those guys signed to a one year deal, but um, he's one of those guys I think we should pick up. He's actually exceeded my expectations. I knew he was good. I knew he had a lot of talent. I just didn't realize he was going to perform as well as he did. That was a nice surprise. Moving further into game prep, two X factors for the Eagles on Sunday. One offense, one defense. Two X factors, guys that, you know, we're probably not thinking about that should be decent is what you're saying? Sure. Uh, X factors, uh, if we can ever try to avoid the temptation of beating ourselves and stick with the run game, <laughs> like we just forget to run the ball sometimes. Like Miles Sanders isn't 100%, which has always been a knock on his career. He's played the full season this game, but um, a lot of the the lack of carry or lack, lack of activity you saw from him versus the Saints was a result of a knee injury he's dealing with and him wearing a brace on his knee. Kenneth Gainwell, I wouldn't trust in the passing game. Kenneth Gainwell had some talent. He had one carry, and it went to the house. It was called back because of a bad holding penalty. But one carry scored a touchdown, and then we never gave him the ball again. So if we remember those guys who are on the team, Boston Scott, who I think is a lot better than we've given him credit for, for whatever reason, the ownership, for whatever reason, the coaching staff just doesn't like Boston Scott, and he's got a lot of talent there. They trust him in the kicking game, um, kick return game now. But – those guys have used and used in situations where they can be successful. They can hit a home run or two. Um, defensive side of the ball. I don't know if we call them underrated anymore, but TJ, TJ Edwards is, he's a dog. He's a beast. And he doesn't get the attention nationally. He gets the attention from us. He gets the attention from guys who covered his game. He gets the attention from people in Philadelphia. But TJ Edwards, I think I looked this up the other day and I didn't look after Dallas or New Orleans, but I trust it is pretty consistent. Every game he's been in, he's finished top you know, one or two in tackles. Or he's tied for – and on one other occasion that he didn't, I think he tied for third. So T.J. Edwards um, just has a nose for the football. He's smart. Isn't the rangiest guy. Isn't super fast, but he's game fast. So um, T.J. Edwards can cause a lot of damage in the um, – it's not 
And it's consistent because we're not seeing interceptions, but he's always around the ball and he has a high pass grade um, as far as defensive coverage and things of that nature. So um, those will be the ones. Our middle linebacker, our center call on defense, and if we can trust the running game to stick with it <laughs> for various points of the season, that may actually shorten the game and do what's been done to us when we've lost. Just People just hammer us with the running game. So maybe it's time we give some others a taste of their own medicine. Well, I did my research on linebackers the other day because the Giants don't have any good linebackers right now, and they'll probably go into free agency of the draft. And TJ Edwards, as you mentioned, well, as you mentioned, all these different guys are free agents. I believe TJ Edwards is a free agent, so that's going to be one of the many guys. And two, well, I guess one thing I can guarantee you, uh, Jeffrey, is that, uh, well, Boston Scott's probably going to have a touchdown against the Giants this game because that's always what he's good for. I think he's, what, nine of the 16 career touchdowns are against the Giants. But um, moving uh, towards the Giants' side and game planning against the Giants, two X factors for the Giants, one on offense, one on defense in terms of stopping different things. Not to be disrespected, do we have to stop anybody besides Saquon Barkley? <laughs> and if he doesn't I mean, play, I'll be honest with you, I don't know who the backup running back is. <laughs> so it's Matt Breida. It is Matt Breida. It is Matt yeah. Breida. So um, limit the running game, man. Um, nobody – and I like – I'm a Duke guy. I, I like Daniel Jones. But nobody fears Daniel Jones' arm or anything of that nature. So um, do what's been done to the Giants all season when we see success against the Giants. Try to limit the running game, things of that nature. Um, let me ask you a question because I've actually heard sure. it. So is there any – We've heard some back and forth about the fact that Giants are still upset about the fact that they thought we laid down against the Commanders. <laughs> when we laid down for the Commanders, they went to the playoffs and y'all did. We've heard there's still some anger and some angst about that and everything. So, um, and obviously, Dayball wasn't there during the case right. of all this happening and things of that nature. So, we were kind of wondering if the starters were going to come and show out and kind of send a message back towards us and things of that nature. But um, from your understanding, they're not. It's it's gonna it's interesting. It's been a debate among the fan base. I don't think they've given word yet as what their game plan is in terms of playing the starters or not. If I'm gonna make an educated guess though, if they're like if for instance, if the Giants are in the game, whether they're leading um by like a seven point margin or under, or they're losing by a seven point margin or under, my guess is they'll keep the starters in. But if it's like a two touchdown game, they're gonna be like, you know what, we gotta start resting these guys. And you know, that there's I could agree with that because you want some of these guys to not have rust. And at the same time, though, we're always plagued with injuries. So that's where I could see both sides of uh, the story for the Giants this week. Yeah. And um, obviously, um, I think the last look I gave probably in three weeks of succession, probably in that last week where the Giants were probably the highest blitzing team in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken about that. So, um I wouldn't necessarily maybe say a player, but I would probably say like an idea or a theory. Um, the Giants pass rush or the Giants blitzing. I'm still thinking about Jalen Hurst and that right shoulder and things of that nature. Like we don't want to see him popped. And there's a possibility that could happen, especially in this situation with Lane not playing, things of that nature. So my fear would probably be there. And my fear would probably be against the Giants running game because we've had a tendency to get to be gashed. Um, Jonathan Gannon scheme relies on getting pressure, getting sacks, um, having guys play a lot of zone, a lot of off coverage, um, a lot of trail technique from the corners. Darius Slay and James Bradbury, who James Bradbury, you guys know very well. James Bradbury isn't necessarily a speed corner, but um, he's smart, he's intelligent, things of that nature. So, and um, they have kind of cooled down from the hot start they've had at the beginning of the season. So, um, again, I'm not exactly sure if Daniel Jones can take advantage of that with his arm, but We've had a tendency to be susceptible to run. And um, I would um, advise that they spend a little extra film study and trying to keep that from happening and trying to keep Jalen as upright and as healthy. So um, I, I really am concerned about the fact that even though we feel like he should play, um, how dangerous it is to put him out there, especially with him not being 100%. Definitely. Uh, last thing, do you think the Eagles will get a win on Sunday? And where can people find you in your work? I think they do get a win on Sunday. Um, and best case scenario for me is the Giants don't play their starters. The Eagles get a decent lead. And rather than do the, what the Cowboys do and run up the score against backups <laughs> against you guys as JV, 
I think once we realize that the game is saying we can go ahead and sit these guys down, finally let them get some rest, best case scenario, have them have a week off plus the second half of this game. Um, I wouldn't say the Eagles win by two scores, but I'd say they win by a touchdown plus. Um, find me on Twitter. I'm at to see at the bottom at GQ underscore the number four EBA. Um, inside the Eagles, I-G-G-L-E-S dot com. Um, and on Twitter at Inside Eagles. There you have it. Like, comment, subscribe to all the good stuff, everybody. Be sure to check out some of Jeffrey's work. Appreciate him coming on tonight to discuss Giants Eagles. We'll see what happens on Sunday, and then it's playoff football for both teams from there. Once again, thanks to Jeff. Thanks to everybody. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye.